sort of do pay bills and read student fiction. I have another room that I write in. Looks like we're streaming on Facebook. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have a, another room that I write, that I use really just for writing. Okay. Jen is back. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> So I am so excited to announce that yes, we are streaming live to Facebook and our event has officially begun. It is such an honor to be with both of these two amazing writers who I admire so very much. I have been so looking forward to this conversation and just honored that you all have chosen Pagination Bookshop, um, our little bookshop here in the Ozarks. Um, <laughs> to host this amazing conversation. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. So I wanted to share with everyone in the webinar, welcome. Um, I wanted to just kind of give you all a little, uh, some, some helpful tips on interacting within the webinar. So those of you that are attending, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you are welcome to submit a question into the Q&A portion and toward the end of um, Karen and Margot's conversation, um, Margot will be sharing some of those questions from the audience. And those on Facebook are welcome to ask questions as well. And I will share those with Margot through the Q&A. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and just welcome all of you who are joining us on these different platforms streaming, I'm sure all over maybe the country, maybe even the world, <laughs> which is very exciting. Um, before I turn the event over to these two incredible women, I just wanted to introduce myself. I mean, my name is Jennifer Mervin. I'm the owner of Pagination Bookshop, a little indie bookstore here in Springfield, Missouri. And I know both of these incredible writers through the Sewanee Writers Conference community, which I was so honored to attend a few years ago um, as a Tennessee Williams Scholar, and that's where I met Karen for the first time, and it is a, a memory that I just cherish a summer, um, a few weeks that just, I don't know, they just change you. It's it's an amazing community, so I just wanted to give a shout out to Sewanee, <laughs> a community I know all three of us <laughs> adore. Um, so before we get rolling, I wanted to officially introduce both of our authors, so I'm going to go ahead and start with our featured author of the night who is celebrating her debut um, of her novel, Sibelia Drive, which is gorgeous. I just finished it three days ago and it's still staying with me. It's very atmospheric. Yes, <laughs> it's so colorful too. It's so beautiful. Um, yes, I love it. Um, so I'll introduce Karen first. Karen Cecile Davidson's novel, Sibelia Drive, was published by Braddock Avenue Books this very week, October 2020. Her stories have appeared in Story Magazine, The Massachusetts Review, Five Points, Colorado Review, The Los Angeles Review, Passages North, Post Road, Iron Horse Literary Review, New Delta Review, and many other prestigious publications. And her awards include a 2018 Ohio Arts Council residency at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown and an Atlantic Center for the Arts residency, a 2015 Studios of Key West residency, which of course, if you read her novel, you'll see very much Florida featured very much in the novel, which is gorgeous. Um, a 2012 Orlando Prize for Short Fiction and many more awards. Her fiction has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net, as well as shortlisted in several writing competitions, including the Glimmer Train Short Story Award for New Writers, the Marguerite McGlynn Fiction Prize, the Nelligan Prize, Jamie Gordon Fiction Prize, the Faulkner Wisdom Writing Competition, the Bridwort Prize, the Redhead Women's Prose Prize, and the Autumn House Press Fiction Contest. And also, Karen has an MFA from Leslie University and is the interviews editor for Newfound Journal. So, Karen, it's such a pleasure to celebrate your debut and your pub date, and we're just so excited for this novel to be out in the world. Thank you, Jen. Okay, and now we have Margot Livesey. Um, Margot Livesey, whose novel, The Boy in the Field, 
was just published this August, which is a stunning novel and just kind of took my breath away for a whole day. I just kind of inhaled it. <laughs> um, you'll see what I mean when you read it. Margot Livesey's first book, a collection of stories called Learning by Heart, was published by Penguin Canada in 1986. And since then, Margot has published eight novels, Homework, Criminals, The Missing World, Ava Moves the Furniture, Vanishing Verona, The House on Fortune Street, The Flight of Gemma Hardy, and Mercury. And of course, her newest novel, The Boy in the Field, was just published this summer by HarperCollins in the U.S and Hoddard and Stroughton in the UK. The Hidden Machinery, a collection of essays on writing was published by Tin House Books in 2017. And Margot is also a beloved teacher. She has taught at Boston University, Bowdoin College, Brandeis University, Carnegie Mellon, Cleveland State, Emerson College, and the Iowa Writers Workshop, Tufts University, UC Irvine, where my parents met and fell in love, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the Warren Wilson College MFA for Writers and Williams College, and she has been the recipient of many prestigious awards, including the fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation, the NEA, the Massachusetts Arts Artist Foundation, and the Canada Council for the Arts. And Margot is currently teaching at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop, which is probably the most prestigious workshop in the nation, if not the world. The planet. Yes, the planet. <laughs> Absolutely. So as I said before, I'm overwhelmed with gratitude. So honored. Thank you so much for letting pagination be part of this amazing conversation. And I'm going to turn it over to you both. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. What generous, amazing introductions. And we should begin by saying that pagination is open 12 to 5 um, every weekday and you can order online they'll ship anywhere in the country anywhere in the universe so you have a chance to patronize this wonderful shop and um, it is so thrilling to be here um, on the publication week for Sibelia Drive uh, novel that I first read I think perhaps more than a year ago and <laughs> just had the um, great pleasure of rereading. I loved it even more the second time which is saying a great deal and I just have to begin by asking Karen to read for us because I really want to hear <laughs> these beautiful words in her voice. Thank you Margot, I really appreciate that. Um, I I think we'll just start at the beginning with one of the many points of view, which we can talk about later. Um, we'll start with the first chapter, which is in Lulu's viewpoint. And Lulu at this point in the novel, which ranges over 10 years, 1967 to 1977, is all of nine years old. And the chapter is called Girl, October 1967. Rainy paraded down on us the year my daddy left. It was the year when daddy traded in our family car for the red and white VW bus. Mama took to watching Peyton Place on Tuesday evenings and I attached the gold stars for spelling around my dresser mirror. The Beatles asked us to sit back and enjoy the show from the stereo speakers in Saul's room and the central Florida sun lit up the house like it was on fire. It wasn't like we all we didn't all know change was coming, what with Vietnam breathing down my daddy's neck. On that October morning in 1967, daddy put on his gray green uniform and went to war. Mama put on her zigzag mini dress and went grocery shopping at Hall's Marquetessen, one of the smallest storefronts on one of the busiest streets in Anna Clara. That was where she met Rainey's mother, Ava, Right in the middle of the produce section, mulling over avocados and melons, they had that dumb conversation about how to choose one. Mama chose Ava instead, dragged her past the checkout counters, right out the door and into our lives. It wasn't like she was a replacement for my daddy. It was just one of those things Mama did, like marrying more than once or bringing home a stray cat just because it had pretty eyes and then realizing the cat belonged to the Lingstroms around the corner. 
Not that Ava was a stray or anything. Of course, Rainy came with her. Straight blonde hair and these freckles that coursed across her nose like fine sand. She caught me on the upside of down. Now here was a girl I'd seen before on the school playground. The girl with the pretty dresses and the charm bracelet that jangled when she moved. She wasn't in my grade, but the one above. She shied away from me at school, but now I had her right in my own living room. You know how to play jacks? I asked her. She cupped her hands and shook them, then lowered one in a pretend toss. What about board games? I pulled her into my room and showed her the boxes piled in one corner. Life, mystery date, and old shoots and ladders. She only shrugged her shoulders. You know how to play any cards? I figured she did. Of course her answer was, go fish. But she said it more to the shag rug on my bedroom floor than to me. Pretty soon, Rainy practically lived with us. Ava too, when she wasn't lounging on a beach somewhere, luring in the GIs on leave. I was thrilled, a friend all my own. One who'd follow my every step fasten her arm in mine and stick to the rules. The way she said my name, Lulu. The L's looping around inside her mouth, soft and undecided, made me want her as my friend even more. Right away, I just loved her to death. Once, as Rainy slept, I scissored her long hair in half and she woke up with the shoulder length cut she should have had. Sure, she was surprised looked at all the blonde on her pillow and cried. My mama evened it up where it fell crooked and then punished me for good measure. And Rainy got used to it. She got used to a lot of things around here, like getting in on the action even when there was no action and we had to make some. Spying on Mrs. Laurent next door, knocking over the Callahan's garbage hands and blaming it on the Walbright's dog promising to meet my brother Saul at the lake and then stealing his hidden stash of cigarettes and sitting up in the orange trees and smoking. The road we lived on, Sibelia Drive, circled the lake and curved around big yards and driveways and houses that were mostly one story. My daddy had built our house, so it was one of the newest in our neighborhood. All one floor with the citrus grove in back and a yard of live oaks out front. We lived on a corner with lots of windows and sliding glass doors. And I told Rainy if she paid attention, she could see everything that went on. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. That was wonderful. And it does such a good job of introducing Lulu and her magnificent, relentless intensity, the intensity she brings to the friendship, but also to many other aspects of, of life. Um, it's wonderful that people have already started asking questions and I hope you'll keep typing them in and the first question to come in is one that I was going to ask so I'm, I'm going to pretend I pretend I had the idea at the same time um, which is how did you how did you come up with the very inventive structure for this novel I mean, many novels don't go directly from A to B to C, but your novel especially doesn't go directly, <laughs> very indirectly from sort of A to G to B to F. It's true, it's true. The, um, and I love this question because this was, this was a structure that I didn't intend to give the novel, it just happened because there are, when I realized that it was going to be set during the Vietnam War and this was basically a home front story, I knew that there would be multiple points of view because there are so many voices in wartime. So um, part of it comes from the origin of the novel, which it was many things converging at once. We were as a nation becoming involved in Afghanistan and Iraq. And this was sort of subconsciously bringing back memories of my own childhood. I grew up 
like Rainey and Lulu during and Saul during the Vietnam War from the early 60s through the aftermath, which went really into the 80s, but definitely through the late 70s. And I knew that if I wanted to tell a complete story about the small community in Central Florida, that everyone had to be involved. And it was, I did set up a very steep climb for myself with writing the novel. Um, I was thinking about it today that about how to describe the structure. And I've always thought of it as the many, the many um, viewpoints are like spokes of a wheel. Each spoke is a different perspective. And then the hub and the rim are the landscape in which these stories are told. And if you want to go to actual geographical landscape, it would be Florida and Vietnam. So, so these things are containing those stories and allowing them to happen and turn at the same time. So I thought that was kind of a good analogy. <laughs> I like that very much. It was, it, was, it was definitely a steep climb. And I, I thought from the very beginning when I was basically dared to write a new story in the early 2000s by a writing teacher of mine. And it was such a good dare that she said it with, with spark in her voice, I dare you to write a new story, that um, it, it gave me permission to go forward into doing something I'd never done before, which um, perhaps was a little, a little ambitious, but it was intended to be link stories. And then I realized by the time I got to grad school, no, these, with the help of a, and my advisor, Lori Foos, this is a, a novel <laughs> that's coming forward, despite the fact that there are so many different perspectives. And is, did you find yourself writing um, non-linearly, um, non-chronologically? Was that something that just came instinctively or was that part of the process of figuring out the novel as a whole? Yeah, it's interesting. Much of the story is told in chronological order between 1967 and 1977, but there are some chapters where I felt with peripheral characters, where I felt that in order to give a background for who they were and how they were important as one of the many voices in the story, I had to go farther back in time. I had to go, I had to go to a time before the Vietnam War and um, and then, and then reach out a little after we stopped sending troops to Vietnam and also when the United States military left Vietnam. So, um, and the fact that they're, they sort of, <laughs> they're not really, they are in a chronological order and then they come out of chronological order, depended on the character, but it was purposeful. Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, besides your teacher's dare, what a great idea to dare someone to write a story. Um, can you say what was sort of the origin or what propelled you into, into this? I mean, you talk about the conflict in Afghanistan and Iraq, but there must it seems like there must have been sort of more that made this resonate for you. Yeah, there was a... The, the initial story that I wrote wasn't the one that you all heard. It was um, Rainey's chapter, okay. which is which has developed and changed and been cut and so on and so forth in order to fit into the novel. But it, but it did start with Rainey's voice and it came from a memory of growing up at an early age between between when I was born and seven years old, I lived in um, a, a small town in Central Florida, Winter Park. And we, a friend and I, we were both six years old or so. We were walking through her lakeside neighborhood, which 
I committed to memory somehow and is basically where Sibelia Drive is, even though it's not. Um, and we were wandering through the backyards, which led into orange groves and into more backyards. And we heard this woman screaming and wailing and crying out. And then the sound of shattering glass. And of course we had to know what in the world was going on. So we approached the house where the sounds were coming from and there was a woman standing in a sheer nightgown in the middle of her carport surrounded by this brilliant broken glass and china. It looked like every piece of breakable, anything in her house was, was there on the carport. And I, I remember feeling pretty scared about this moment oh. and we, we retreated, but it stayed with me. And so like these, these sort of telling moments that you, you put to the side and you don't think about them for a long time and then they come back in a very sharp piercing way and need responding to. So that's pretty much <laughs> the true origin of the story. Yeah. Is that and, memory? Yeah, and an amazing scene in the novel, which um, yeah. Yeah, it's a very harrowing scene. One of the pleasures of Sibelia Drive is how much you know about lakes and orange groves and charm <laughs> bracelets and canoes, um, but also about Vietnam and what was happening there at different times, the different stages of the war. And, um, I was curious about how much research you did, if that was sort of an organic part of the novel, or if you interviewed people or went to libraries or watched movies. Um, I, didn't, I didn't realize when I started that first story, which I thought was just a story, not the beginning of a novel, that um, I would become involved in so much research, but there was an incredible amount of research. Um, the, the, when I, I thought about it during the past weeks uh, about the different kinds of research that I had to do. And the first one that really stumped me was a, a major part of the novel, which had to do with military. I am not, my, my grandfather was in the Navy. My father was in the Navy in Norway. And, um, but I didn't, I never asked them questions. So I didn't know anything about that. So I, I um, as we do, I got online <laughs> and I looked up different military rankings. I found an amazing assortment of military maps that were specific to, um, our presence as, as, as the American Army, the US Marine Corps and so forth, um, all, the, all of the different tactical areas that were set up. And I thought I better talk to some people about this that actually were there. Yeah. And I, was, I got in touch with a United States Marine Corps group of um, combined action patrol, which are the peacekeeping um, squads of Marines that were living in vills with the villagers, building schools and getting medical supplies and building libraries and things like that. And it's, it's not that they didn't have to go out and, you know, it's not like they weren't soldiers or anything, but they were, <laughs> They were an interesting group to talk to, and they set me straight on all the things I was doing wrong. At first I had Lulu's dad as a lieutenant, a first lieutenant, and I was, I was told, absolutely not. He, he did not, he was not drafted. He didn't go to school at West Point or whatever. He enlisted and he was a sergeant. And I said, okay, <laughs> I obviously have a lot to learn. So right. just in terms of military, um, I 
I looked up other things like the anatomy of a canoe, which I, I know canoes, but still there are all those different parts. Yeah. And um, the blueprint of a one story house that would have been built in the 60s mm -hmm. and oh, nightclubs in West Palm Beach. So it, it was fun rubber plantations in Vietnam. It went on and on. It was fun, but the military aspect of it was, was very weighted. I felt responsible to get it right. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully I have. And, um, and I feel also honored to have spoken to um, the men and women who served our country because um, they a lot of them didn't necessarily want to be there right. but, and they and there is a, a a silence and a weight to it but they were at the point in their lives where they were willing to to come forward and talk to me so i feel very grateful for that yeah. i do think research is one of the great um on under underappreciated privileges of writing novels. I mean, if I wasn't writing a novel, I think I'd pretend to just so that I could do research <laughs> because you do get to all kinds of people are willing to help you when you say you're writing a novel or writing about something. It's really amazing how generous people can be. It's so true. It's I was stunned. There were I mean, we were speaking by email. Mm -hmm. barely by phone I still am friends with some of these men that are that also are writers right so yeah yeah it's, it's been a good a good um it's been a good process and I loved what's happened with it yeah. um, well we're talking about about craft issues um Claudia asks what was your revision process like? Hmm. <laughs> Describe it. <laughs> yeah, um, the when originally I thought I was writing link stories, and I sort of dug my heels in and refused to think of this as a novel, and and then I realized. I had three different readers early on and they all agreed that it would be better to merge the chapters and have them flow a little better so that they actually were chapters, not stories. So that they weren't just so distinct because they were very connected and over there was a lot of overlap going on. So I probably, I don't know how many revisions I did. I lost count. <laughs> But I know it was probably somewhere near 20 times at least. Um, and I had, I don't know if there, everybody has their own version of like how to keep track, but I, mine was post-it notes. And so, and I'm in, I'm in this funny little space. I have an L-shaped room in a Cape Cod. In front of me, there's a wall on this side, there's a wall. There are lots of walls where I can take down the artwork and put up post-it notes to start another novel. But there was an entire closet door covered with post-it notes and another one on a wall, just in order to keep track. And um, I, one, of, one of the things that I realized as I was going through all of these different perspectives was that I had to really be careful about keeping their voices distinct. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was quite telling. I had to um, go back again and again and again to take language that belonged to a specific character and excise it from other places. Like only Minnie would say these things and only Saul would say those things and don't mix it up. <laughs> So, but I appreciate that question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, revision, I mean, I think especially now when so many of us are using computers for so many things that the separation between writing, revising and editing is much less distinct than in the days when Jane Austen wrote Pride and Prejudice behind the parlor door. 
Right. <laughs> you can imagine all of the paper. <laughs> so much paper. Yeah. yeah. Um, and your characters, I mean, speaking of keeping them distinct, they are wonderfully distinct. It's one of the deep pleasures of the novel, how many interesting and complicated characters there are there are in the foreground there's Lulu, Rainy and Saul and Minnie and Eva the two mothers sort of hovering and occasionally <laughs> making an appearance um, but then there are also the missing fathers some of whom reappear and some do not and then there are neighbors and dogs or at least one crucial dog. Um, so did, I mean, am I doing a good job of describing how you saw the characters with the three yes. young people as really the kind of main focus and the adults, however important, a little behind them? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and this is actually reminding me of your book because the boy in the field, because your three main characters are also children who are coming of age. And the, and the adults do seem to be more in the background as well. Yeah, um, yeah I, I have a lot more peripheral perspectives than you do. <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I was sort of, um, I was wowed by the when I when I was reading the boy in the field with the crossovers that were happening between our two novels and it sort of I don't know it was it was as you said yesterday it was eerie <laughs> no I mean I mean of course I was struck by that the first time I read Sibelia Drive but even more I think on on rereading about the similar way, the somewhat similar way we orchestrated things. And I think one of the things we both are um, committed to, I would say, is the autonomy of teenagers or the autonomy of young people and how, as a young person, you can have a very intense and passionate life that is really quite separate from the adults around you. And the adults around you may know very little about what's going on and what really Right. matters to you and that's certainly true with Lulu and Rainy and Saul and Alan before he disappears. Exactly and I, I think that writing a writing of of kids who are growing up in the 60s through the 70s it was a time of go out and play and these these particular parents were very detached and Ava's just She's gone. She's, very <laughs> she's often she's often West Palm Beach looking for wealth and fame, in very strange ways. And um, yeah, the the um, the way that your novel is happening right at the edge of the millennium in the late '90s. There's still, I feel like there's still at that point and maybe especially in England, a, a go out and play your safe moment, even though there is, there is danger out there. Yeah. Yes, no, I think um, it, it, before the age of the mobile phone, perhaps people had more autonomy right. and uh, both, both our no novels have relatively few phone calls. <laughs> Um, um, somebody else is asking, um, what was the most difficult part of writing in different voices? And I, of course, wondered if there were voices that were harder or easier. I mean, I know in my own work, there's usually one character who flows more easily than another. Yes, um, the, the character that I felt I had to be the most careful with is Royal, Lulu's father. Mm -hmm. And he has a, he has, I won't 
spoil the moment. He has a profound experience and it follows him, of course, back to Florida from Vietnam. And I, let me back, let me back step a little bit. As a teenager growing up, in the South, there were a lot of boy, men, they were really boys. They were in their late teens, early twenties, um, coming back from Vietnam. And they carried this immense weight with them. And it, and it was a weight that was silent. They didn't talk about what had happened. And, and we didn't ask, we were, the kids that were still at home who were too young to be drafted, who were 16, 17, and at that point the draft had ended, we, um, we, we, it wasn't that we knew better than to ask, it just wasn't, wasn't something that we worried about. And we, and I always wondered about this kind of, this kind of silence, especially after talking to the Marines that I talked to and talking to um, the veterans, army veterans and so on, um, who, who did it, who admitted that yes, they, they didn't want to talk about it right afterwards. They were still trying to process it. And so with this in mind, I felt very strongly that I had to get Royal right. Mm -hmm. And so that it was, it was complicated and it took some time <laughs> there's, there's a point in his chapter where there is a move from first person into second person, which is sometimes a way of distancing oneself from something that's painful. Mm -hmm. And editors asked me about this and I said, it needs to stand. <laughs> because this is, this is something that is very, I think, I feel like it's sacred. It's not something that can be touched because this is, this is territory that is very fragile. And um, this character has been through a lot. And, and th I think the only other character that really <sighs> took a long time was, um, Helene Laurent, the neighbor that Lulu and, and Rainey spy on. She was a French colonial who grew up on a rubber plantation in Vietnam. And she is going through a time in her life at the time of the novel, living in Florida next to the Blackwood family, Lulu's family when she realizes that she's entering stages of dementia so to write a character who's going through this process is, is a little baffling. And I definitely did some research on that. And uh, to, to write scenes where someone is living more in the past than in the present is, um, is, a, is challenging. <laughs> it took some time. So those, those two characters were, the, were my were my mountains to climb. <laughs> and and it, it, um, another question, I want to pause after this next question to just talk about the little, a little bit about the novel as a whole, but s someone asks, um, do you revise by voice or more by the chronology of the story? And I wasn't even, I'm not entirely sure that I understand that, but I'm just repeating. <laughs> well, I think that I would say by voice, um, if I'm, especially if it's something I'm trying to get, I'm trying to refine it and bring it to a place where each voice is distinctive. There's definitely a lot of revision there. Um, the, as far as the, as in terms of the chronology or the lack of chronology of the novel, um, I think that's one of the reasons that I used post-it notes is you can stick and unstick them and move things around. 
And I don't, I don't, I added a lot on the beginning of the novel and on the end of the novel. The middle kind of happened and then I added more on the bookend parts of it. Um, so, so in terms of the, the structure, the linear part of the novel coming from, be, from beginning to middle to end, um, there were definitely some, there was some movement there, yeah. sure. Um, no, I was going to say, this isn't really a question so much as a comment that one of the things I was very fascinated by was the, the plot and subplots of, of the novel. It's quite a tense novel to read. The, the stakes are fairly high most of the time, but this, the, what those stakes are hot, what those stakes are varies in the course of turning the pages. And there is a kind of larger plot overarching the characters and um, which get us, gets us to a very satisfying ending. But within that, there were a lot of sort of smaller plots and stories that are being worked out. And, you know, the characters sort of are circling Sibelia Lake and people leave and return or don't return or don't leave. And um, one of the things that I really loved was the way Rainy and Lulu are their friendship and their enmity. <laughs> um, they're sometimes quite fierce enemies as well as quite best friends. Um, how that just runs through the novel is sort of the spine of the novel um, with all the other events moving around them. And I love the way that you make them grow up because I think that's quite a hard to, thing to do to move a character from 10 or 11 to in through adolescence and into some version of adulthood. Yes, that's that's true. And in, in terms of voice, um, from the last question, there as far as the revision goes of these particular characters, Lulu and Rainey, there was and Saul, there was so much involved because they keep changing. You're not the same, you don't have the same voice as a 17 year old that you do as a seven year old. Yeah. So <clears throat> I um, I mean, just the way Lulu acts in the beginning, she's just sort of, she's so flippant and, and, um, and she just wants to, you know, come up and, and shove you just to see what's gonna happen. Yeah. And later on, she becomes more, she's still got that feisty edge to her even at the very end of the book, but she she's relaxed a little bit into herself, and and I think and and Rainey certainly um, I don't know if she was a, as much of a challenge <laughs> as Lulu, but uh, she she definitely had to be careful there with her as well. Well, Lulu is a great character because. You never know what she's going to do next. Is she going to steal something from the neighbors? Is she going to throw the dog in the lake? I mean, <laughs> you, you, I mean, I don't think she ever does that, but but she has a wonderfully unpredictable quality that is very, very persuasive. And we get that at the opening with her cutting the hair. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, Steve Tracy asks, um, Wrinkle in Time was a big children's book of my youth, and I'm curiously reminded of it by your two books. Do either of you have feelings about that book? I love that book. <laughs> I, I need to go back and reread it. I have not read A Wrinkle in Time since I was 12. It's been forever. <laughs> and I, I know they've come out with a movie and all kinds of things surrounding it but um it 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 was it was deeply affecting when I read it I remember when I finished the last pages it was toward sunset and my mother came into my room and said it's getting dark do you want me to turn a light on and I said no no don't turn the light on you'll ruin it 
I wanted it to happen as the sun was going down those last passages. So I can't speak specifically to the characters and to the writing of the book. I just have this amazing memory of it, um, of the emotion that I felt reading it, which was, which was a good one. <laughs> uh, and I have to confess that um, I have never read A Wrinkle in Time and maybe now's, maybe now's the time, maybe <laughs> to, to start that wonderful novel. Um, and I did want to ask if you had literary influences or literary models that books that you thought, oh, that that's useful, or I could use that, or um, was somehow helpful in thinking. Absolutely, about yes. Um, in fact, my computer is sitting on top of them, <laughs> so that it can. I'm using a laptop, so I had to raise up my computer, but I have on my desk. Usually at the back of my desk, I have um, books, mostly by women who write novels, which I think of as really story collections. And in a way that obviously affected my structuring of this novel. And the, the first one being Love Medicine by Louise Erdrich, mm, which um, it was published as a novel yes. and, and a, along with um, Jennifer Egan's A Visit from the Goon Squad yes. and Elizabeth Strout's Olive Kittredge. Mm -hmm. these, these, I believe, I don't know about Olive Kittredge, but I believe the other two were sold as, were published as novels, but Yes. Um, Jennifer Egan even said, I, I consider them stories, but it's okay. You can call it what you want. <laughs> um, and also uh, from, a, from a while back, um, Stephanie Vaughn's Sweet Talk, which mm -hmm. is a beautiful collection of stories yeah. um, about a young girl and her mil military father and her family. Yeah, and Charlie Dog. Yes, exactly. Yes, in, in England. It, absolutely. Yes. Because the, the title changed. Abel Baker, Charlie, Char wait, Abel Baker, Charlie Dog, was that it? I think so, but I guess. Yes. yes. Um, in fact, I had the British copy first before I had Sweet Talk. <laughs> and I think it was Elizabeth Graver that may have introduced me to Stephanie Vaughn. I can't remember, but probably just like she introduced us. <laughs> but those are definitely some books that that influenced Sevilla Drive. Yeah. Um, no, it's. I think it's. There's something very um, exhilarating about how the novel keeps reinventing it itself in various ways. You know, we have auto fiction, we have novels, <laughs> um, graphic novels, we have novels put together in all kinds of ways, and it's it's exciting to see how you can make things both fragmentary and coherent, almost cubist or prismatic and still have them hold together. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and we just have time for a, a couple more questions, but I think Karen and I also both wanted to recommend a couple of books. So, in the hopes that people will ask a couple more questions, I'll just say that I wanted to talk about um, my former, reluc very reluctantly former Sawani colleague, um, Randall Keenan's book. Um, Randall published a new collection of stories um, in August. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking. I'm just going to hold it up. Um, if I had two wings, a really yeah. beautiful book, <laughs> full of life. And um, sadly, he passed away before he um, knew that the book was long listed for the National Book Award. But um, I do recommend it as a really radiant, funny, wonderful collection. So if you have a chance, um, do look for it in your local shop or library. So 
I um, I would like to recommend this book. <laughs> Isn't that cheap? Way in the Field by Margot Lesy. I actually just finished it a few days ago and I love this book and I can't wait to start it all over again. I can't say enough beautiful things about from beginning to end, these three children would just capture you and take you straight all the way through to the gorgeous ending. It is, it's, it just makes me happy. <laughs> And then um, I wanted to call out some, I have three, call out some small press loves of mine. Um, the, the next one is also a novel, the, the Distance from Four Points by Margot Orlando Littell, another Margot, but without the T at the end. And I don't know if these are showing up backwards or forwards. Yeah, forwards. Or forwards, great. And um, she, is um, this is her second novel, and she each vagabond by name was her first, and this is published with University of New Orleans Press, so a little woo woo to small presses, and she is very much like Margot in my book is she's centered on place and her place, which is also her place of origin, is Appalachia, so. Um, which is in keeping with pagination books, which is also in Appalachia. And then another one, these are the next two are books of poetry. And um, this one is with Black Lawrence Press and this is Charlotte Pence's Code, which like Margot and my book has, it involves three characters. You might call them speakers in poetry, but Charlotte actually refers to them as characters. There's a, a new father, a dying mother, and the and that mother's DNA, which and they're gorgeous. And then on the final note, Parasite Kingdom by Brad Richard, which came out a couple of years ago. It's the it's a word works book. And um, it's a beautiful, I would call this collection a beautiful warning, which and I, gotta, I wanna get this right, so I'm like looking at my notes, which might bring us to the fly on Mike's head from last night at the debate. Be kind to the fly, beware the king's henchman. That's what this is about. <laughs> what, what wonderful recommendations, thank you. Um, and um, I wanted to ask before we, uh, we have, one more question on the screen, but I wanted to ask on my own behalf a, a personal question, which is, how did you how did you become a writer? Did you start writing when you were Lulu and Rainey's age? Um, did you make your way slowly to writing? Um, did you um, have a teacher who said you're really good at this? Um, I suppose. I, I went to schools where writing was encouraged. Mm -hmm. I mean, normally in schools, writing is encouraged, but I had teachers that um, from, the, from the very beginning, even when I was, you know, just forming tiny little sentences and learning the alphabet, they were just very, they were kind and compassionate and encouraging. And by the time I got to high school, which was in New Orleans, I had a freshman English teacher who asked us, <laughs> this is so typical too, he asked us to write about what we did during the summer. And I thought, all right. And I didn't write about what we, what I'd done during the summer. I wrote about a trip with my family, my extended family um, to Cozumel and being on the boat together. And I didn't think it was anything special, but he embarrassed me to death by reading it aloud in class and saying that it was a fine example of active, elaborate writing much above a ninth graders level. <laughs> so I said, okay, maybe I'm good at this. And I just kept going. Probably with a few detours. Yeah. 
So, so I have to say a shout out to all the teachers out there who have really difficult time right now for encouraging their students, even online. So thank you. <laughs> um, and we have a last question from uh, Claudia. Um, I'm curious about how you feel writing in the first person and what is the narrative occasion that starts the narration in this book? And I think we've covered that in your wonderful description of seeing the woman in her nightdress with all the broken mm -hmm. glass and china around her. But I was interested in what, what how you would respond to how you the question about writing in the first person. This was a this was a decision that I was encouraged to change to third person, mm -hmm. and in by and by many different people, not necessarily the three readers who began who read the novel as a whole through its many different iterations, but 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 especially teachers that I was working with. Um, and also to lose a lot of the perspectives was encouraged. And I, I think that I just really wanted to get into the heads of these people in a very intense way. And in third, even in third person limited, it just wasn't close enough. So I, re I just really, I was determined. I wasn't going to listen to anyone about changing it. And I stuck with it. And I don't know if I'd do it again, <laughs> especially with something like 13 different viewpoints. Yeah. Um, I didn't but, know, but there are a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so just to dig deep, in order to dig deep. And I think we should probably be coming coming to an end so that people can raise glasses of wine to you, purchase the book and settle down to read about Rainy and Lulu and <laughs> find out what happens. And I, I love being able to hear how a book I love comes into the world. I just find it so interesting that complicated and often quite long road um, that is a book's journey to being the beautiful object we can hold in its hands. So thank you so much, Karen, for writing this book. Um, thank you to Braddock Avenue Books for <laughs> publishing this book. Thank you to Jen Mervyn for giving this book a home in the world and helping it to leave home. Um, it's it's a, a wonderful accomplishment, Karen, and I hope you're celebrating wildly and widely. <laughs> thank you, Margo, so much. This was a wonderful conversation, and thank you, Jen, for hosting. I'm so I'm so happy. I I was in the car when I emailed you, and I knew that I was going to run out of um, internet connection, and I was typing like mad on my phone. And it all came together so quickly. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just so happy. Thank you so much. Well, I think it was meant to be. And I think on behalf of everyone listening in the webinar and everyone, you know, that could tune into Facebook tonight or, you know, will be tuning in to the video because it will sort of live on our Facebook page <laughs> for all of eternity. <laughs> Thank you both for these wonderful insights. You know, I if I could just indulge one question as a writer myself and maybe on behalf of many of my students who I see some of them in the webinar and um, some out in Facebook land, um, you know, I, I think it's so interesting to listen to, you know, someone who's published several novels, Margot, <laughs> and someone with her debut novel, um, I, I hear a lot from writers, you know, that certain novels kind of teach you things that each each book sort of gives a, a recognition about the craft or the writing life. I'd love if you wouldn't mind maybe just sharing a little bit about maybe what these two novels maybe have taught you about the practice of writing or yourself as an artist in the world at this time. 
I don't know who wants to go first, but I would just, just my own curiosity. I'm just so curious to hear, hear what's kind of what these books have taught you. What a, what a great question, Jen. Um, well, I will bravely plunge in. Um, previously, um, Previously to writing The Boy in the Field, I had written a collection of essays called The Hidden Machinery, which um, were essays about, about writing um, and craft essays. And so one of my challenges in writing The Boy in the Field was to have my own advice, sort of as it were, lingering <laughs> behind me and all the things I and I think they're incredibly wise and sensible things that I say in the hidden machinery, but it was also a little intimidating to then be trying to follow my own, own advice. And I think the thing I learned writing the boy in the field that, um, I'm, that I'm trying to carry forward is the, what I what I've been I would say what I've also been re learning recently from rereading Willa Cather, which is, you know, how you can get characters to a certain level, and then you can get them deeper, and how rewarding it is when you can really get a character to that deeper, less coet, um, less easily summed up level. I mean. I think often when we're talking about other people, we sum them up rather briskly. You know, we say Richard is always late because he has problems with his father or Francesca cannot finish her dissertation because, and we, we kind of under, feel sometimes like we understand other people so easily. But when we think about ourselves, I think we find ourselves very mysterious. And I think our best characters come out of acknowledging that everyone is mysterious. Everyone has things that don't make sense or that they can't explain. Oh, I love that. Yes, like that mystery. And that also keeps you probably super engaged with your book too, because it keeps that mystery alive for you in the craft. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Karen. And so yeah, and um, I would agree about the about characters. About as far as writing Sibelia Drive, I um, on the one hand, on the larger scale of things, I didn't, and I do think I've done this. I didn't mean to write a political novel, but I kind of did because the Vietnam War is in there, and everybody's got their different point of view of as, as in terms of the characters everybody has a different term, point of view um, going on with how they feel about um, how the government is handling it why are we involved at all and so on and so forth and and in dealing with the the character development understanding eventually that a character doesn't have to be perfect and a character perhaps is better if if he or she remains imperfect because that makes that person more complicated and more um more complex um and and also in terms of the relationships that overlap in the novel and at a universal level. So, I mean, we, we are complicated. <laughs> Outside of fiction, we are complicated. So to bring it into fiction seemed, seemed, um, seemed only fair. <laughs> so I did, I did learn a lot about that going, going through the process of writing this. That's a great question. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Thank you both for indulging me that question. I just couldn't resist the opportunity with you both here in, in front of me. <laughs> so yes, I we're right. We're a little bit after seven. So I want to thank you both so much for your time and even more so for your incredible talent and these books that are out in the world. I have so enjoyed spending the life. I feel like I've just been 
hanging out with you for the last several days, immersed in the pages of your novels. And they have been such, such a gift in my reading life. And I, I can't wait to share your insights with my students and with our customers at Pagination. So thank you both so much. And I hope everyone gets these incredible books. I know um, Karen and I were talking about how her book is currently backordered on our site, which I think is probably a great problem to have because it means everybody wants your book. Um, but I just wanted to encourage people, you can always just email us at paginationbookshop.com and we'll get you your book. And Margot's books are, um, are available on our website. And I did want to mention before we end, um, I just wanted to put in a brief plug for our next virtual event. So next week on October 15th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, we are featuring three more incredible women, um, two poets, uh, Jamaica Baldwin and Rachel Neve Midbar, who will actually be zooming in from Israel, which is really exciting. I think it will be 3 a.m. her time. <laughs> so kind of amazing. Um, and the fiction writer, Michelle Bidding, uh, all from the Pacific University MFA community. And um, our reading will be in honor of the poet Marvin Bell, who was all of our teacher, is all of our teacher, continues to be, is such an amazing man. Um, and who just was featured in the New York Times. So we're really excited to dedicate our reading to him next week. So um, I just wanna thank you both again for being here and what a gift to listen to your wisdom and advice and insights. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm now a Midwesterner, so I could say all night, all day long. Yeah. So I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting, but if anyone has any other questions, I will hang around on Facebook, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions and, of course, pass these along to the writers as well. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Margo. Thank you, audience. Yes, thank you, <laughs> readers, for coming to listen. We are very, very appreciative. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.